<laughs> Hello to all you wonderful people out there. You're tuned in to Pod for the People, episode five. And wow, I can't believe it's already been five episodes already. Time flies when you're having fun. This is your weekly podcast designed to keep you plugged in and connected to what's going on in Santa Cruz and the exploration into philosophies of people within our community. If this is your first time joining us, I'm your host, Drew Glover, born and raised here in Santa Cruz and candidate for the Santa Cruz City Council elections these November, providing a window into my world, the people I work with, and the issues that impact the people and the environment in and around our city. Of course, I can't go any further without letting you know that this podcast was created with the help of the 365 Producer Program. The 365 Producer is an artist training program located right here in Santa Cruz. 365 Producer students learn all the skills you'd need to create podcasts just like this one, as well as music, video, photography, and artist development. Check them out at 365producer.com, and I'm sure you'll like what you find. If you heard last week's show, you know that we were visited by Christopher Van Hall, a progressive pastor in Santa Cruz talking about his inclusive approach to spirituality and the reclamation of Christianity from conservative extremists. And we were offered a glimpse into the life of a veteran and holistic healer with guest Paul Damon. For this week's episode, the word of the day is ephemeralization. What is it? Where does it come from? And why does it matter? To help us answer these questions, we have a special guest, filmmaker and comedian Noel Murphy, who recently released a documentary called Bucky, that focuses on the man who coined the term ephemeralization and the concept of doing more with less, R. Buckminster Fuller. Great to have you with us, Noel. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Drew. Yeah. <laughs> I love the music. Thank you for that. Yeah, you know, I, I always try to find music that fits well with the guests of the day, and for some reason, some swing time music was calling to me with you. Yeah, we're, it's just, I belong on a New York subway listening to clarinet jazz. <laughs> I uh, have only been to New York City once, but it was a great experience, and I love the videos of the saxophones and the clarinets. Oh, yeah, forget about it. <laughs> what, are you telling me not to go to New York? No, forget about it. <laughs> Are you telling me you're not to come? Forget about it. That means come to New York. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Obviously a comedian. Um, so a comedian and a filmmaker. That's a pretty interesting combination. Just so that people know kind of a little bit about your background, like how long you've been in Santa Cruz, why are you here, and what got you into comedy and filmmaking? Well, I overdosed on LSD my first night in town in the early 80s, danced on the roof of a Santa Cruz police car, and decided to make it my home. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the real answer. No, I did come to Santa Cruz a long time ago, and it just seemed like a wonderful place that really fostered self-expression. And I didn't have to be here long to realize this was a town filled with people who understood what it meant to belong, to create belonging for others. And so that's, hence, keep Santa Cruz weird, right. i.e. keep Santa Cruz belonging. <laughs> right. So I've um, been to New York. I've spent a lot of time in some of these places, traveling especially, and it always seemed to come back to Santa Cruz. So. Mm. Back uh, in 93, I decided to quit stand-up comedy as my vocation. And, um, oh, I wasn't funny at all. And I cashed the checks, and I felt dirty. I, oh, <laughs> if I had been funny, I, I, maybe I would have felt clean. Oh, this isn't the time to solve. I'm on a, you're on a podcast. Yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so anyway, um, one, of the stories that I, one of the stories I relate is about being a comedian and working in a club in New York and having a guy in the audience that was so drunk and everybody just kept serving him, and I was wondering when the wait staff was going to cut this guy off, but maybe somebody's electric bill was late, so they were working it and yep. for the tips, and this guy had, you know, like eight or nine shot glasses on his table. He gets up to leave. He drops his keys. He drops his keys a second time, and he leaves, and I'm on stage watching this, and I just walked out and followed him. I walked off stage in the middle of my set. <laughs> hmm. Something a little bit more important. Followed the guy out into the parking lot, took his keys away from him, and looked through the window of the club from the parking lot and I could see my empty stage and all the knuckleheads that literally allowed that to happen. And plus, I ducked gunfire once or twice. I thought it would be good to get out of comedy and start working for what Buckminster Fuller called a world that works for everyone. Now, I didn't know it was called that. Mm. I was just, what's my part, this belonging idea? What's my part? Where do I fit to feel good as a human being? And what are the rules of the game? I mean, kids find that stuff out through trial and error as Fuller you know talked about and i found you know through a series of trial and error 
one of which was in the late 80s. I worked at Ocean Chevrolet, uh, used cars. Anyway, I don't want to talk about it right now. I'm, they're paying for the therapy, if that tells you anything. No, just kidding. Okay, so anyway, um, just there's always a difference between me in integrity, Noel, and me out of integrity, Noel. And one has a whole bunch of characteristics that I'm not really interested in being run by. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in feeding those characteristics, characteristics to other people. And so that means I've got to give something up, and that would be my own agenda. And the more I would do that, I would also attract things to force me right. into waking up a little bit about what was going on, you know. And one of the things that through my inquiry into Buckminster Fuller was privilege. Like how deep an understanding of privilege from someone else's point of view mm -hmm. can be especially when i was taught that i'm really special and i can wish things <laughs> into existence which is great because we can watch the secret i'm going to use my sean connery voice. quantum physics the secret is that you can attract to your life prosperity you know but the thing it's also true is you got to be able to see above the fence line to attract prosperity. Mm -hmm. And there are people, you see the pr drawing with the boxes, and you've got, it's sort of a way of showing discrimination, is who can see over the fence? Everybody's the same height, but when one person takes the box that's taller and leaves someone else a smaller box, you, they can't see over the fence. And I yeah. think that a world citizen is what Fuller talked about. And I was trying to have that conversation with someone the other day, actually, about the difference between equality and equity and using Ooh, that. I want to hear that. Yeah, it's using that box analogy that you're talking about where you have people of different heights that are trying to see over the fence, whatever it is. And most times you see the picture, it's them trying to see like a baseball game. And equality is everyone has the same size box where they're all standing there. But if people of different heights, if you're too short to be able to see over the fence and you have the same size box as everyone else, then you still can't see the game. Yeah, so, but, but I own the fence company. Right. No, just kidding. <laughs> you got to watch out for the fence guy now. <laughs> equity is the idea that looking at where people are coming from and the needs that they uh, are required or that are necessities for them to be able to see over the fence are what they need in order to be equitable so there's an equitable uh, equitable ability to see over the fence so, so i the want a verb for that the tallest person might not need a box but the shortest person might need two boxes so ah, the taller yeah, person yeah. gives the shorter person their extra box so that they can see over the fence they have more boxes than the taller person but they both have equity to see the game so it's important to you know draw that distinction between equality and equity especially with that box metaphor yeah, and I'm gonna I want to hear that explanation in different forms too, mm -hmm. because I have a feeling that's a theme through your campaign for for city council. Right. Yeah, and that's one uh, one of the things. You know, recently there was a free screening of your film. Uh, it's called Bucky, uh, a Fuller Future. I encourage everyone to check it out. What are you gonna say? No, I'm yeah. <laughs> I well, I smile. That's my kid. Yeah. Right. That's uh, my boy. It's a wonderful, <laughs> girl. wonderful yeah. film, and uh, we had a free screening of it actually because you were generous enough to offer it to the community at the Resource Center for Nonviolence a little over a week ago, and I was able to go and sit through the film and enjoy it with a crowd of other people, uh, and really powerful and awesome stuff in that film, the messaging, the ideas, and the concepts of Bucky or our Buckminster Fuller represents the policies and ideologies that I carry into this city council campaign and the work that I do in the community. So it was just a fantastic reminder, but it also expanded on some of the ideas that I have already been working with and provided greater insight to the past. I mean, this was a film and a, a guy that was espousing these ideas 50 years ago or something like that, you know, in like the 60s. What were you tuning in on? Uh, from the idea of, and we'll talk about ephemeralization a little bit later, yeah, or yeah. the idea of doing more with less, the idea of societies that work for everyone. Uh, but before we get into that, because I, I want to play a clip from one of the trailers to give people an idea of okay. what it's all about. Um, I imagine a lot of people from my generation, especially who might be listening to this, don't know who our Buckminster Fuller is. You know, I wasn't taught as a curriculum in school of our Buckminster Fuller. There's no classes in college of like focusing on ephemeralization and all Or Hunter Thompson, I might add, but l that's for later. That's another, <laughs> n another documentary you probably have in the works. Um, so, you know, transformation, innovation, compassion, inclusion, all these really big ideas. But from your perspective, since you are a resident, uh, our Buckminster Fuller expert, who was our Buckminster Fuller? Who's Bucky? Well, um, 
Thank you for putting it that way. I, I feel like I'm an expert at my own pursuit. There you go. And, <laughs> you know, who Bucky was to me when I was 10 years old was a, my friend's friend who had a lot of power and influence over him so he would can't so I was at Harvard University with a man named Brother Blue or Dr. Hugh Hill professor of divinity at the uh, field divinity of the uh, the school there at Harvard mm -hmm. and um, which I believe was the original school by the way mm. um, if I have that wrong get it get back to me folks <laughs> but um, Bucky was Brother Blue's mentor and so as a 10-year-old kid, I first was invited to come to Harvard and perform with Brother Blue, who I had been already performing with for the faculty of Harvard on slavery. Mm -hmm. And the job I was given, now remember, Brother Blue described me as the little kid, the little white kid on the Wheaties box. <laughs> you're so pure like the white kid. He goes, oh, you're pure like the white kid on the Wheaties box. My man, he's so pure. Oh, you know, it's like a, that's Brother Blue. You, people know my Lord Buckley thing, but. Brother Blue was just a, a really, really loving guy, and his mentor was was Bucky, and so I was getting these concepts as a kid, not unlike yourself. You had an idea, what you were just mentioning, Drew. You had an idea, and then you found that your idea crossed Fuller's principles. Mm -hmm. You were already onto that idea, and I call that a Sinternet. I have a name for it that <laughs> I've been writing about called the Sinternet, and that's where your preparation intention the power of your commitment your declaration the amount of help you've had whether you can be felt from space yet or not critical right. mass all that stuff when you start getting to that things get really really amazing and you've already been on to those principles so you were sort of searching for Bucky Fuller too in a way and so when you f saw the film if it film if it resonated for you then that's perfect mm -hmm. and also Fuller's ideas are how you're running your campaign from what I understand, you're running a green campaign. A green campaign, yeah. yeah. Focusing on how we can uh, benefit the greater commonwealth uh, as opposed to a specific sect or smaller group of people and really kind of push home that idea of inclusion and representation, both in policy making, but also in the concept of climate change, the environment, how we can uh, be prepared for the people of tomorrow and what we can offer to them so that they can have a better opportunity to make the choices that you know, improve on the choices that we're making today. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that um, feeds into the concept and the information from the film. And these ideas that we've talked about throughout the show are really consistent among a lot of the people that I look to for how I structure my philosophies and ideas. People like uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Cesar Chavez, you know, these ideas of community power, community engagement, but also we'll get into one of my favorite quotes talking about creating alternative systems. Uh, but before we get any farther into it, just to provide some context and give people a feel of your, your film, I have this clip. It's uh, on Vimeo, and the link will be in the comments section of the, of the podcast for anyone that wants to check it out. But this is the trailer for Bucky, A Fuller Future, featuring Jeff Bridges, Reverend Deborah Johnson, and an amazing collection of people talking about our Buckminster Fuller, with Noel in interviews and just really highlighting his life and his work. So here, check this out. We don't inherit the earth. We borrow it from our, our children. Yeah, I can feel the generation before us and after us. Come on, guys, do your thing. They're rooting for us, man. I can feel it. Meet Bucky Fuller. He has been called the Leonardo da Vinci of our times, the grandfather of the future. He coined the word synergy and gave us the geodesic dome and he was known for his conviction. A world that does not work for 100% of humanity doesn't work for anybody. And this is a time where our, po our popular culture, even our political culture, is dominated by small ideas. This is a time for real people, big people, to think big thoughts. This is a time for big ideas, and it takes big thinking to meet it. 
takes big action to meet it. And Buckminster Fuller was a world historic person. He was a world historic thinker. He thought big ideas. not only contemplating suicide, but actually taking action and moving to carry it out at the shores of Lake Michigan. He said he had a mystical experience. And suddenly he felt himself uh, floating off the ground. And uh, I was told, you've, you've got to think straight. He was not going to, to shrink. He was going to rise to the occasion and turn his tragedy and his difficulties of his, of his early life into something positive. It feels like a very volatile world right now. But it's also a very exciting time. And uh, it can be a very a joyous time. Especially when you take action So a lot of great points, comments, and kind of ideas in even just that trailer. And how long is the full film? It's 90 minutes now. 90 minutes. It's powerful. Uh, there's so much to unpack, even in that two-minute segment of kind of conversation. And one of my favorite quotes, there were some great ones in there too, but one of my favorite quotes from our book, Mr. Fuller, is you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And he understood this, but he was not the, you know, it's great to, like I said before, bringing it back to the, him not being the only person understanding these ideas, because even revolutionary groups like the Black Panthers work to create alternative structures like the uh, food programs for the communities when the other programs from the city and from their surrounding area were failing them. May I mention something yeah. about the Black Panthers? I think that their original structure and even where they ended up going, I mean, they were interfered with by the police so much and their structure was literally broken up and, you know, just hurt by other forces. But if you take a look at, a you know, Italy, you know, 300 years ago, I mean, you had societies that were doing okay. You had people, villages and people that were doing okay, but they had certain structures and those structures always began with the importance of the child. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Same thing with the Black Panthers. You know, and people get this image of Black Panthers with the shotguns and so forth, the pictures from Harlem, but, but they were protecting. They were, act, they were acting as, as security, mm -hmm. trained security. And by the way, they never got in trouble over it. There were never shots fired that I'm aware of from, mm -hmm. the, from the Black Panthers. But uh, I have a lot of respect for Eldridge Cleaver. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the Black Panthers are an amazing group, and they were their message and their ideology was skewed because they were challenging the power system. So instead of highlighting pictures of them feeding the hungry and creating alternative institutions that supported their communities, the ideas or visions that people get when they think of Black Panthers, if they're not aware of the core messaging of the movement, is one of violent militancy, which is interesting in the world of nonviolence, because I work at the Resource Center for <laughs> Nonviolence, which you know, is right. there's a, a conversation of is it okay to say that you're militantly nonviolent, right? Is the term militant, is it inherently a bad thing? And that's a whole other conversation <laughs> that we could get into. Right, but could I admit something? Yeah. And you can cut this out if you want to or not. <laughs> what I enjoyed about seeing the Black Panthers with guns was watching certain white people get the crap scared out of them with absolutely no understanding of what was going on. Henceforth, specialization. But we shouldn't talk about specialization until we've talked about what? Ephemeralization, exactly. Which is a very exciting concept. And by the way, your love life requires it, all right? So we want to keep you tuned in. <laughs> and that's the, that's the word of the day, ephemeralization. So I'm glad you brought it back because that was something I wanted to talk about at the beginning of the show. And so it's this, this is something that I think that we need more of in our local government, right, in general, or government in ge just across the board, especially with the spending that we have on a national level on some things that we may feel are less of a priority for the greater good of the world. Uh, but ephemeralization, in other words, means doing more with less. Um, you want to go into more detail about ephemeralization? Well, it's a favorite. It's a favorite concept. It's also bad news. I love it for the unconsciousness part. We all tend to want to hold on to a little of, at least. Mm -hmm. and 
because the whole person gets involved. If you're living a life using uh, what Bucky Fuller called a generalized principle like ephemeralization, a tendency for things to get smaller and smaller, a ten tendency for nature to reduce to practice. Nature doesn't waste anything, but it doesn't keep everything. Right. You know, and so ephemeralization is that building and birthing. If you, Deborah Johnson, uh, in her book, um, The Spirit Letters, talks about the difference between birthing and building. And I think that is a good... A good Bucky wanted ephemeralization to come from a place of whole system consciousness within people. Now he wasn't a spiritualist about it. He was kind of old school Maine, ah, old Maine, old school, old family, the whole bit. Mm -hmm. He didn't start out to be a transcendentalist, which, by the way, his aunt Sarah Margaret Fuller, or Margaret Fuller, as most literary folks know her, uh, was an early transcendentalist working with Thoreau. Well, not Thoreau. Um, Anyway, I'll remember later, but she was, you know, working with the, the literary elite of that era, you know, Louisa May Alcott. Those people were all transcendentalists. They believed that there was an ethereal connector for humans to that which is spiritual first. And, um, but, but then the idea that we're all connected to each other is a very natural step. And if you think about pre-Walden, you know, you think about that era— those people talking about spirituality in the form of metaphysics, stepping outside of Methodism, Catholicism, Christianity on different levels. Jonathan Swift had written his, his uh, argument against the abolition of Christianity probably 50 years earlier. So you, you have a lineage that made it to Bucky mm -hmm. that's making it to you. And the whole idea of the film is to make it to everybody, right? Because <laughs> why not? I like a party. And, yeah, and there are a couple of things that are, <laughs> are featured in there. The like Reverend Deborah Johnson talking about the difference between change and transformation, right? Where change is just mm. a shift, where yes. transformation is a new rebirth of something completely different that they can yeah. uh, bring out and kind of alter the realities that we've been accepting as normal and being able to approach it from a new perspective and a new uh, idea of what is normal or possible or capable or achievable right it's a an amazing idea that is impactful to me because there are things that i share in these philosophies not only the the or uh, communities or systems that work for a hundred percent of people which is something that i'd love to see here in santa cruz because right now we're seeing a severe shift in the prioritization of funding that's going on in where we're putting our money. And I say this in the, uh, some of my previous shows that I've talked to with people as well, but Dr. Martin Luther King said that a budget is a moral document. And so we have to be looking at where we're prioritizing our energy, where we're prioritizing our money and asking ourselves, are we creating a society that benefits 100% of the people? And if not, what are some shifts that we can make to make it so that it's more engaging and inclusive of providing those resources and support? I want to, all I want to do is like tag on a slogan to your campaign, <laughs> which is Drew Glover, a Santa Cruz that works for everyone. Right on. And I believe that that's what you stand for. And I think Bucky, Bucky'd fall in love with you is what he would do. I mean, I can't speak for what Bucky, everybody, well, what would Bucky say about this then? Like, how the hell do I know? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm curious. I'm an, I'm an inqui inquiry you know, all my own for this. I, I sure I'm this sort of torch keeper right now, but there are people that have been really working on the Buckminster Fuller legacy for a long time. Most of them have helped on the project. I've got an enormous amount of support. But ephemeralization comes down to something that I find as a very funny concept. I've stood with MIT mathematicians on the issue. We've actually discussed it. <laughs> I don't understand their answers completely, but that's nice. <laughs> Nobody that understands their answers all yeah. the time. But the idea of ephemeralization is you can do so much with so much less for so long that eventually that history, America, America, people, humanity, whatever, we all have the possibility of teaching ourselves how to do everything with nothing. You know, you can go into some Zen interpretation of what the word nothing means if you want to. But our experience of our cellular world, our world that involves structure, carbon, you know, um, it's, I don't think Bucky thought it was completely exclusive. And so when you're thinking about what humanity's potential is for ephemeralization, he proved in his mathematics called synergetics that, that it, you know, that there was no limit. 
you know, and by the way, the buckyball got the name buckyball named after Buckminster Fuller when they found carbon C60 in outer space and they wanted to study it and figure out what it was and what the compounds were, what, what they looked like. And when they finally, I guess, got the equipment where they could reduce it down to that size, they found that it was the icosahedron. It was, you know, the shape that Buckminster Fuller said that the building blocks of a triangular, self-supporting, self-sustaining, interdependent, interattractive, <laughs> interaccommodative. Are you with me so far, yeah. folks? Because I love you too. <laughs> Principle, life, regenerative, holistic, thriving place that reflects the way human beings were designed to be. He didn't find that to be true. He found that our designs conflicted severely with our natural ways of being. And so his solution to that is called design science. Mm -hmm. Design science, or as he said it at the time, industrially feasible, comprehensively realizable, anticipatory design science, meaning so much more can do with so much less that eventually we train ourselves to do everything with nothing. Two plus two equals five. We literally, when you define synergy, what you have is the unpredictable sum total of the parts themselves. Mm -hmm. So when we take everything that goes in motion, you don't know what the relationship to the cup of water, to the microphone, this beautiful, expensive, oh, I spell, there's suddenly there's an interrelationship, right? Everything really does relate that way. And Bucky did the math and science to show it, especially so that people who dealt sort of in, let's just say, languages about the new age, you know, however we're talking about these times where we have new languaging to things um bucky tried to be practical and pragmatic i mean he his stuff was checked out by einstein so the stuff we talk about on the street yeah i want to attract a, something and i mean no you're not making this stuff up but we do have to realize how to use it and the idea of uh new and innovative new innovation new ideas new approaches to problems because even in the film there was the critique of why are we building houses the same way that we built houses 150 years ago why aren't we doing things that are more conducive to not only the needs of our everyday lives but also in stewarding the environment and that was another great quote it's the only reason there's pollution is because we haven't figured out the value or how to capture the things that we're releasing into the atmosphere so these ideas of looking at a problem figuring out how we can approach it and then coming up with solutions by working together with ideas. You know, there's that saying that the only difference between magic and science is magic is science that we haven't figured out yet. It's that idea of what do you mean doing everything with nothing and who's willing to be open to that and kind of run with that idea and figure out ways that we can move towards that as opposed to avoiding it or trying to resist it. And this comes back to the solution oriented problem solving but it also reflects the presence of a building intention without any birthing in other words no like this is how lead certification ends up working and sustainable design is you've got to be able to speak intelligently about the inter attractive interactive systems how traffic nearby the organic field is going to affect your ability to even call it organic mm -hmm. i mean this is you can take design science and put it everywhere and I, I was actually thinking it might be fun to play a game that I've been, you know, playing called the world game. But my own version of it is um, called Searching for Bucky. And it's the idea of searching for Bucky is I want to take a look at design and say, do I find Bucky in the design? Am, am I seeing a sustainable uh, hallmarks of sustainability? Am I seeing uh, a, a, a virtuous cycle? Mm -hmm. That isn't even being called that because the people who are doing it don't even know that that's what it is. And you mentioned the virtuous cycle before we get into the game. It's this idea of interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. And we live in a society that emphasizes individuality and separation. Your car, your house, your food, your life, your work. But in Let the, go of my ego. Right. <laughs> my, my thing. My that, ego. That my I, wor ego. I worked hard for. It's mine. I shouldn't have to share it with anyone. And But... <laughs> It reminds us and comes back into yeah. this idea of interconnectedness where even in the film they talk about how the 
food that we eat that then we exp- that becomes part of us and lives within us, and then we expel part of the food that goes back into the Your earth. cells are just stopping by for a minute, Right, folks. and so it's this idea of <laughs> yeah. people being aware and conscious about this so that we can start transitioning into an interdependent community instead of an independent community. And that comes back to the core idea of creating spontaneous cooperation. And the thing that, you know... There's, because Bucky isn't here today to see the changes to address to what he called general adaptability, generalized principles being reduced to specialized application. Mm-hmm. And if you take a look at design science today, you know, you're going to find it in certain things. You're going to find it in other things. But when you take three ideas, I'll just go through them quick. First is pattern integrity. You know, if somebody can't recognize a pattern, you know, it could it could actually interfere with their ability to be alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can think of a million ideas. I won't give examples, but you know, when you think about synergy as being the force that governs bodies in motion, so you have the effect on every body in motion, on every other body in motion. This is the whole butterfly in China that flaps its wings and creates a storm over here in uh, Fremont. No, I don't know where that came from. It's Fremont, the storm in Fremont. Oh, there's always a storm in Fremont. Let's go through Melpitas, honey. Anyway, I'm back. <clears throat> so, the the um, I, I the, you can you can take me out of the com- comedy club. I'm sorry. Yeah, just snapping back and forth between Noel and random travelers. <laughs> well, that's that's exactly how we do it. But when we're when we're dealing with synergy and we understand that every action I take, this is hard to deal with. Every action I take has a synergetic impact somewhere out there. And the more unconscious it is, the more it's going to land somewhere you don't want it to land. Mm -hmm. That's why clear intention is such an important thing. A clear intention about about what we want to put out there. And, you know, I'm a big believer in the idea of atonement as sort of a generalized principle, if you will, that people's ideas of being unforgivable, that their pasts are so horrible that they can't, bloom or contribute or be powerful today you you know whatever it happens to be i'm in the wrong i'm planted in the wrong pot you know Mm -hmm. when we get in touch with our purposes as people this stuff becomes a little bit more moot and starts to be seen as the excuses to not get in the game that they are Mm -hmm. there really is no excuse not to express yourself fully and bucky isn't even saying that you know well actually i would say that that's kind of the bottom line what bucky's saying is ask yourself you know, who am I? Why am I here? Admit we lo- we know very little. You know, uh, Jeff Bridges was talking about individu- individuality. You were talking about that a minute ago. Mm-hmm. And the idea of rugged individualism. Right. I used to have this little skit that I did where I'd wear a little cap with a tail hanging off and I'd have a little powder horn and I'd be the rugged individualist who doesn't need anybody. Here's another traveler for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the rugged individualist doesn't need anybody. The rugged individualist is a literally, in the terms of ephemeralization, is cut off completely from the blood flow. You know, the person that thinks they aren't connected to this and behaves that way, one of the ways is saying, leave me alone. I don't need anybody's help. I can do it alone. But there's lots of other ways that their rugged individualism affects other people. It's not how we say cricket in the synergy world. But the but one of the other aspects is to think about processional effect so in terms of what political systems could do in design is cut off negative procession effect so if you've got a procession of something down in the levee or whatever it happens to be if it's a budget or house issue you know um, when you take a look and use fuller principles you can make that change sort of where everyone is a lot happier about it. Mm-hmm. You, it. It's the ability to enroll it into normally disagreeing parties is very powerful because Fuller came completely from the science of it and the joy of the fact it works this way, the way the founding fathers, like, you know, I mean... The, and, and he wasn't trying to force people into seeing his perspective, only offering it for people to be able to be exposed to and choose whether or not they were in a position mentally or spiritually to jump on board the train and if not he didn't waste his time trying to 
force people into his box of, of, of understanding, even though he was very much outside the box, he would wait until he found someone that was ready to engage and then use their combined power to create some serious change happening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was his 1927, 28 epiphany year period of silence where he very specifically wanted to divest himself of all the thinking that he hadn't actually done himself, mm -hmm. which is a pretty big deal. Because very, you know what? Very consistent along all of our realities. Yeah. Being totally I'm speaking only for myself when I say I'm stuck on Band-Aids. Band-Aids are stuck on me. <laughs> the, the idea that we have these thoughts and advertising messages and these things and jingles running in our heads. I mean, what do you th really think about something? And it, I picked my dad's opinion about Fords. Mm -hmm. And then I met the Chevy people and they picked their dads because their dad said Chevy. And now you've got this weird, you know, what? You've got what's called nationalism. Mm -hmm. And Bucky addressed nationalism on the perspective of our energy grid and how if we did marry our systems between private sector, wherever, whatever it might be in government, we could have had everyone fed in the world years ago. Yeah, and like I was saying, that's back in the 60s that he was coming out with these ideas and suggestions at the same time as you know during the civil rights movement and when all of this transformational energy was happening in the united states in general um throughout that period of the 60s 50s 60s and 70s of kind of a waking up and transitioning away from business as usual but then of course running into the resistance of the establishment which is very common when dealing with established power structures as soon as you start to come in with an effective and uh, potentially alternative idea that would take or redistribute power and or wealth, it's usually met with a lot of resistance. So usually, I mean, that's my general... I want to give you another traveler voice now. Yeah, that. okay. <laughs> what do you got? Uh, <clears throat> well, what do you have to understand? Uh, Daryl, is that your name? No, Drew. He's, <laughs> right? of course, the character we get your name on. Daryl, what you got to understand is oil's good for folks. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm really saying? Are you feeling me? Right. Look into my eyes. Right? <laughs> if, it was, if it wasn't good, why would we be able to use it? Look, yeah, clean coal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's those terms. and uh, Well, greenwash is what we call those terms. Greenwash terms. Uh, so that's another thing is especially talking about fuel and oil and the fossil fuel industry. Santa Cruz is in a position where it's made a statement already that it wants to divest from fossil fuels, specifically by moving its money out of banks that support uh, the development of oil pipelines. But unfortunately, there's not a state bank that can handle it for them, and none of the local credit unions here in Santa Cruz are able to handle that much of a uh, influx of cash to handle the city budget and all that other money. So it opens up the possibility for the conversation about an alternative system, which is actually going back in time to a previous system that existed, which is postal banking. And so there's the potential that we could push for postal banking uh, in California and ideally around the country that would create banking institutions in post offices, which would decentralize the power of banks and allow us to effectively divest as a government municipality from fossil fuels. Absolutely. And also what is interesting as far as how that might affect the power structure, the inability to control the poverty of someone. You've mm -hmm. just lifted someone out of poverty if, they, if you give them banking as a basic human dignity, mm -hmm. which the post office has had the has the capability to do they don't count great over there so if we <laughs> finally do it i don't know i'm kidding just might, <laughs> might miss a package or two here or there yeah i'm sorry oh was that for you oh, are you eating grandma's <laughs> cookies that came in from the east coast but you know i'm trying to look for the design science and unions for mm -hmm. example i'm looking for the bucky i'm looking for bucky in what santa cruz needs right so give me something and let's see if we can talk about whether or not I mean, how about a system other people say works that you don't entirely agree with and you could even say, hey, what about this? Where's the design science if I can't find it? Yeah, well, we can talk about housing in yeah, Santa Cruz. Well, oh, definitely. <laughs> That's Let's, a big uh, issue that I... Like, when by I the way, can I sleep in this to the studio tonight? It's pretty, pretty a, cozy, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, it's t times are tough. <laughs> times are tough, and there are a lot of and people... And by the way, there are people who sleep out there tonight. There are people that we've had on the show. In fact, uh, the week before last, we had a guest on the show who is a local artist who sleeps in his car because housing is too expensive i am was facing an eviction and possibly getting moved out of my space which would have left me homeless but luckily that was protected by the just cause eviction uh rules that were put in place in february 
But just talking about housing systems in Santa Cruz in general, if we look at the way that our city government and planning department have structured housing, it's the opposite of sustainable. It's the opposite of the idea of ephemeralization, and it makes it so that we are not serving 100% of the population. We're serving a very small population, and in fact, hurting a larger um, group of people that live in Santa Cruz, most oftentimes are longtime residents or older older folk. I was, uh, you know, I'm the chair of the Santa Cruz County Poor People's Campaign, and we recently had our first town hall, which was this last Thursday, and there we had a testimony on the panel from someone who I went to high school, or middle school with, excuse me, here in Santa Cruz, who has two children. Uh, they're They've been fighting to try to find a place to stay with their Section 8 voucher, which has been nearly impossible. They had to stay. I've heard about that. Had to stay in one of the shelters and had all of their stuff thrown away. Ten years of collectible belongings and clothes and toys and wedding rings and all kids' teeth, all this other kind of stuff. So, looking at the systems that we have right now, it seems kind of ludicrous to continue trying to push forward with this model but that seems to be the path that the planning department and the city government is taking well okay and 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 i agree and you have a situation here where you would need to work with an existing system so how can we add design science which would be to really consider the consider balancing the interrelationships. Mm -hmm. yeah. First of all, you have to believe interrelationships can be balanced. You have to believe that a rich person with their wealth and the house value that they don't want to lose the house because part of their deal is to increase the house by a million Absolutely. dollars by whatever year and the homeless guy over the thing and then the appraiser says, yeah, but you... It's neighborhood, sorry. You know, everybody mm -hmm. thinks that they have a right to monetize their houses for profit. Absolutely. Okay, now this is an interesting idea because, of course, you do. But nobody ever brings it into their morality. That's and a, it's, it's a, root, a, root, a root element. That's the ultimate question. And it, it becomes a conversation of less about, you know, whether you identify as a progressive or a conservative and where you're coming from on that spectrum but more talking about the idea of morality and what is right versus wrong decency decency, decency. Um, and just uh, compassion right that's the word that is always the word of the day for me is compassion and looking at ways that we can be more compassionate and inclusive for people and so while yes on the, the private property side of things uh, there are people in different camps you know the people that want things like rent control and just cause evictions are the ones that feel like it'll impact the cost or value of their property but then we can transition even outside of the private sector and looking at the public city-owned sector there have been plots of properties that the city could have developed affordable housing on but have instead chosen to transition it either into rezoning it for commercial use for hotels which have been which don't get me started on the hotels except that the fact that it's a four or five story hotel on Broadway that could have been an affordable housing unit. It could have taken Section 8 vouchers, all of these other kinds of things, but they chose well, to, you know, to switch it. Sure. And in the defense of the people that are there negotiating those deals, COPA, mm -hmm. you know, any number of housing advocacy groups around town that usually work together from what I understand, they do a really good job of negotiating it, but they get outmaneuvered by builders, contractors who are willing to break yeah. the law. They're willing to jump over permitting processes and pay the fines later because it's still equitable for them. So their fines should be enormous. And Starbucks, in my opinion, shouldn't just get to come in and put any other design. You know that new Starbucks on the corner of uh, Ocean Street there uh, in yeah, what? See it that one looks like the box the gas station came in. <laughs> I mean, come on, folks. What is this? Santa Cruz, ha we, we have a dignity. And if when I went to um, Madrid mm -hmm. to film uh, for, for, for Bucky, I was taken because I rented a car and we got into a weird thing because the car was called a Leon. I said, that's not how I spelled my name. Anyway, that's a little joke. But everywhere going into Madrid, there was art all along the highway. Plants, gar like, a, like a garden mm -hmm. go on each side of the highway. And it's like, who have we become that we're willing to lose our national poetry, our national sense of prose poetry that... There's a sum total to all of our decent behavior that we were asked to do, you know, and you think about, and I, I got another traveler for you, you know, little baby Jesus is born in that little manger there in Bethlehem. Can I have the music? Cue the music, Josh. <laughs> anyway, so did la, 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 la. And yeah, and they had no place to go, and they were immigrants. They weren't Muslims. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I can't go the whole way with the story, but they should have been because... Uh, Some it, people say, I mean, Middle Eastern guy from... That area. Right, but this idea that the level of hypocrisy 
is so deafening no one can hear it, mm-hmm. the, especially the people generating it. Now, Bucky said a very important quote, and what the quote was, best I quoted, is that if you run into someone who is sleeping, let them sleep. If you run into someone who's stirring, kiss them on the forehead and let them sleep. If you run into somebody who's awake, bond with them and others who are awake and together with that we create a groundswell that wakes everyone up right so that goes back to the idea of spontaneous cooperation and i don't think people can cooperate spontaneously with pattern integrity with human integrity if they don't know themselves well enough to understand their belonging if somebody is still working out the idea of whether they belong they're still trying to decide whether they want to be here you know, in biology, they call it apoptosis. You know, a cell kills itself because it can't find its purpose. Mm-hmm. If you can't find your purpose, you know, look a little harder. I mean, it's just not that hard to f- get in touch with a little life purpose. Uh, to be to be totally <laughs> fair to everyone out there, though, it took me I'm, I'm lecturing. 20, 26 years, 27 <laughs> years to find yeah. that purpose, right? But it, And just like Bucky, it took but a, we We need you. It's all hands on deck is the point. Right, and it, it took, for me personally, it took what could be considered a mystical experience, right? I, I was a survivor Ooh. of testicular cancer, oh, had to go wow. through... Uh, really intense chemotherapy and during that chemotherapy I was lucky enough to have someone with me uh, uh, my partner at the time who was just there in uh, unrelenting compassion and support and through that experience I had this vision one day that I woke up just bawling with tears um, about just a reshift of focus and a reshift of priorities and that kind of started me on the path to eventually making the decision of wanting to dedicate the rest of my existence into trying to make things better for other people. And in doing that, opened up a lot of different experiences and opportunities and friendships. Like you had mentioned, uh, you know, as soon as you take that step into wanting to make that shift, things start appearing for you because of the synergy of the universe. Another word for it was uh, mentioned in the film is karma, right? Which is what people are thinking yeah, about. Yeah, uh, Steve Seiden yeah. wanted to call it explain karma in that way which it really is it's it's synergetic effect yeah as soon as that shift happened it it made a lot of things change so when ideally people can all have that experience but if not getting in community with people that do have that perspective and then working together to make some really positive change and you mentioned unions before just a example of how everything is connected you know, with the city council rezoning property to build hotels and giving incentives to the hotel to come in, but then not requiring the hotel to use prevailing wages, which then brings in workers from outside the area that aren't getting paid living wages and taking the money that would stay in Santa Cruz out of Santa Cruz because of the decision made by the city council to rezone this land and give it to a hotel without these stipulations. It not only impacts the availability of housing for people in the community, but it also sends a message to the workers of the area that their existence here is not as important as saving some money on some development. And at the same time, that takes money out of our city that negatively impacts our commerce and, and money here. Right. So. And, and in terms of business, it creates turnover. Mm-hmm. It creates higher cost in original po- employee training, usually involves less of a vetting process and more of a trying out on the floor process, which lowers the quality of service <clears throat> for your customer. Right. And the quality of work a lot of times. Sure. And when you have an unhappy work environment that's disgruntled like that, and then the boss flies in in their helicopter to give the big motivational speech, (laughs) no one's really interested, you know. And especially when it comes to union stuff, I I think the unions back down a little easy. Unions allow, the union reps allow them. This isn't just whether or not we're going to have unions. This is how functional is your union. Like, I hope your union's doing better than the Democratic Party, folks. Zing. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm well, just saying. That's one of the reasons why I, <laughs> I'm a, a large, outspoken supporter of unions. I went uh, over to a town hall in San Jose for the SEIU town hall about America needs union jobs. And it was not only a powerful experience, but it really helped to solidify my understanding of unions and the role they play in our lives and how we all need to fight whether we're in a union or not to make sure that union rights and worker protections are in place to make sure that our cities can operate in a way that respects 
the people in the service industry and at the same time provides living wages for people that are temporary workers of the city. So there's a lot of stuff that we could talk about for a long time. We have about maybe five or ten minutes left on the show. So I'm going to let you choose what we talk about next. Well, I want to I want to finish talking about the effect of a union and the ephemeralization and the design science that could be applied to a union equation. Mm -hmm. So let's just say that if you were to pay, Safeway is probably a good example of a company that pays much higher wages than, than some of the other stores. And the reason that they do it is it's cost effective. It's cost effective to pay your employees well. What isn't cost effective is to pay your employee pay your employees well and not be a good manager if you pay your employees too little and you're a bad manager you're going out of business either way if you're a bad manager so let's not take a look at how to shave off and hide being a bad manager by having wages so low that you're turning a profit while meanwhile all sorts of really bad stuff's going on in your kitchen mm -hmm. you know you're the way to do it is to build a sustainable model. Now, you can sell one steak at Delmonico's in New York for $45. You can go get a, I don't know what it is, but Taco Bell for a, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's, you know, and what profiteers think is, oh, a steak costs a lot less to transport. So they want to isolate the 1% and hit them with that market. And then they want to isolate the lower, you know, level of market share and, and, and hit them with, with what you can sell to people who once you've convinced them that their self-esteem isn't worth pursuing. Mm. Amen. <laughs> can I get a witness? Yeah. Um, worker appreciations and, you know, just this idea of uh, engaging and appreciating the people that are doing the work and making sure that they're being managed in a responsible and effective way that not only applies to Safeway, it applies to large corporations. And the lettuce companies, all the artichoke companies, all the agricultural companies. A Amazon is a fa fantastic example of it. There's a lot of controversy right now with Amazon's uh, treatment of their workers, the way that the profits are being used by Jeff Bezos and also the connections that they have to the ICE technology that's being used to identify facial and, recognition yep, and, per and uh, persecute immigrant families and immigrants in general. And then all of the other kind of negative effects that Amazon has had on small business and all this other kind of stuff. But it makes it really convenient to but, be able but, to go and get things online. Absolutely. And it also is is fairly adolescent in an age where we need a certain level and kind of maturity to not to exclude Amazon from the potential partnership to make them a greener system. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, and also fair trade certifications and how to take your supply line, you know, uh, to, to green. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so there's, these are things that are all being worked on. Is, and, but it seems to me that Santa Cruz would like to call itself a nuclear free city because we have the signs that say we we're a nuclear signs. free city. Yep. I'm not entirely, I haven't been downtown with a Geiger counter lately, but I'm not sure if there's any real trust saying, no, this is the integrity we committed to. This is who we said we were and we're going to be. We're going to continue to inspire people. We were a city that would believe in unions. We were a city that saw itself as sustainable and even lived that way. You could buy your Dr. Bronner's by going down and, you know, getting it out of a big tub mm -hmm. downtown back in the 80s. Mm. You know, and so all of the issues, of course, we have more population here. And but when we continue to do things like buy homeless people bus tickets out of town just for those same people to get another free bus ticket from the city they just went to and get shipped back. Right. Or spend ninety thousand dollars a month on a tent camp that houses 60 people. So the the numbers don't match up. The um, approach doesn't ma match up. And the track record shows that it's not effective in dealing with the issues but you know can i give you some hard stuff about what i think about this because yeah part of it and i know we got to go soon is you know i i really don't buy the whole structure of the way monetization of housing we've got an interesting thing we are a unique piece of land governed by a commo coastal commission on one side a mountain range on the other mm -hmm. and agriculture north and south of us you can't just go run over to the next town and get a job No, if you're here. You've got certain choices, and you're kind of waxed in. So I believe that we should license landlords. 
sorry, folks. If you are a landlord and you got a seven year arm and it got called, you know, in and your, you know, interest rate went through the roof, I feel bad for you. But that doesn't mean that you can you can balance that out by universally shoving Santa Cruz rent so disgustingly high that it's indecent just to hold on to the property you didn't buy well to begin with. Yeah, it's a big controversy, especially with the idea of having landlords, you know, in some ways expect for renters to subsidize their entire mortgage. Well, and it's also to subsidize the American dream, the hanging on to the middle class, mm -hmm. which is pretty much a device of privilege when it's not working well and it's not working well right now. So basically the most vulnerable people that were members of the middle class are not completely out and are one paycheck away from living in the car. And we're living in a city that is fostering that unconsciously and creating more homeless folks. But the more we don't hold these landlords accountable, so why not have them pay for a license and have like you have to have a license for your car mm -hmm. if you're going to own a business if you're going to sell a hot dog on the corner sorry you got to have a business license why should people be able to charge thousands of dollars be able to deliver um discrimination indiscriminately with no visibility no accountability why does that allow why does that continue to happen yeah and, and you mentioned the the term unconsciously perpetuating the cycle, but some would question if it is actually unconscious because the slated, <laughs> the, the slated development. I was being nice. <laughs> right. The, the slated development that's downtown, yeah. there's 600 new units that are planned to go into downtown. A hundred of them are supposedly going to be affordable. And the, the conversation around what affordable means in Santa Cruz is a whole nother show that we could have on talking about the definition of affordability. But that means that 500 units are going to be either market rate or luxury housing units if we have a population of over 1500 2000 people living on the street right now what are 500 luxury and market rate apartment buildings going to do to solve that housing problem nothing the i'd like to know what they're going to do to increase it because i can pretty much tell you that design science says there will be an increase in residual effect there will be a processional effect from mismatching an environmental condition to another mm -hmm. You know, tries ra raising iguanas up there in Nome, Alaska. <laughs> yeah, they don't do well. It's, you, you can't, because you have pretty landscaping, you saw it in a book, you don't always take certain plants. This one's water dependent. That one is sun dependent. That one can live in desert conditions. You know, and a, a classic example is the adobe building, the new adobe building. They did not qualify for platinum lead their first round round, and it, their their model really required it. They got sent back to reevaluate everything. What they came up with, in order to get one dollar more of savings, guess how mm. much you had to get to get one dollar? They were five hundred thousand uh, dollars of savings, and they weren't getting their lead certification. One, you, they just flipped it. And they became a lead certified, platinum certified, and they ended up having to get 500,000 additional dollars of annual savings. We're talking about $1 million that you can integrate back into your building performance. Yeah. Uh, and then it also comes into the conversation about parking and cars, which transportation is another big issue that we talk about. I want a briefcase. George Jetson. Just, just yeah. right there and, and I carry it in. <laughs> but looking at other places that have more uh, bolstered and expanded transportation systems, especially public transportation systems, they have the real, real possibility of workforce housing and car free housing units that allow people to travel to and from work to and from school without having to have a single person vehicle using those extra spaces for uh, garden spaces, child care areas, uh, bike shops, all these kinds of things that we can use in exchange for additional parking spaces like the new library that they're designing. I met with the city manager. He looked at Los Gatos. It's funny you say you look at a picture, you shouldn't pick every plant just because it's in the picture. They're, they're looking at the Los Gatos library, which is this you know, really beautiful library, but then also looking at Boulder, Colorado for the parking garages that they can hide in the library. But the question is, in a housing crisis, why would you be adding parking spaces in a library? Why wouldn't it be mixed-use affordable housing in library structures? I, I actually have an answer to that. <clears throat> you know, 
you're not going to like it because it's going to have to do with human stupidity. <laughs> We're going to have to take this on. Hold my hand. Let's take go. on human stupidity. <laughs> when you have special interests, it's called specialization. When you have generalized comprehensive interests where you kind of see how the pieces fit together or damn well know how they're going to fit together if you're going to do certain kinds of designs, you know, th then, then you've got it. But what happens... The Bradley tank is the classic example that I like. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember the Bradley tank, but the military calls for a troop vehicle that's big enough to carry 12 troops. And so they came back with a thing that could carry 12 troops, and then they figured out that it needed protection, so they put in this, and then they figured out it needed a gun, so they took out two seats, and then they had to take out two more seats. Mm -hmm. And they ended up with something that was like neither an armored vehicle nor a troop carrier, and it cost like a record astronomical amount of money. It was just a classic example of government waste, but government waste occurs by specialization, over-specialization, which, by the way, fuller traced to the extinction of tribes and species. So our ability to maintain fluid general adaptability, to deal and adapt, I mean, anybody in technology will tell you that the skill set of the 21st century is the ability to adopt a new uh, technology while at the same time divesting yourself completely of the habit of using another one and that's what our young people have by the way hello young people we know you're gonna <laughs> we know you're gonna do well we believe in you over specialization so many great topics to get a chance to talk with you about Noel. thank you so much for coming on the show uh we have a couple minutes left but i want to just play us out with some of this Noel style swing music. you don't mind if i dance do you no it's i'm what, a dancer there's just about enough room in the podcast i want to invite people to go to buckyfuller.net take a look at the film our film tour if you're looking to support us absolutely please we'd really love your support but also when you help us out you are what we call part of the team of architects of history we're the architects of history folks we can turn this thing We've got the technology. The numbers work. It's time to get in the game. You're a trim tab. It's inside of you. See how what needs doing in your life and turn it up just a little bit. Tell them, blame it on me. <laughs> just blame it on him or blame it on Bucky. Blame it on Bucky. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, if you get a chance, check out the link. Uh, it's in the comment section of the podcast. Go online, check out the trailer. Check out Noel Murphy. He's also got some other stuff online. Where was it? It was called the... The pl the Dr. Lords Rupert of Opie? What do, you, what do you find over ah, there? Ah, the, the Lord Buckley Live. Yeah. The History of Hip. You can check that out on, it uh, looks like, Vimeo also. Send in love to you cats and kitties. Yes. Snag his finger popping daddies. <laughs> Again, big Dig thank infinity. you. Big thank you to Noel Murphy, filmmaker and comedian here in Santa Cruz, um, who made the movie Bucky, A Fuller Future, joining us today to talk about ephemeralization and how we can apply it in local politics here in Santa Cruz. This is Pod for the People, Episode 5. Catch us next week at the same time on the same channel for a special guest, John Brown Childs, who will be talking about his piece, uh, which is focused on peace teachers in and from California Soledad Prison. He's a part of the prison project put on by Barrios Unidos. Pretty amazing stuff. And he also specializes in the idea of transcommunality, which is how we can build a movement that can account for race, class, and gender, and yet still operate across all of the lines. It's going to be a really great conversation with him, and don't forget to tune in every week for updates about what's going on in Santa Cruz politics. If this is the first one you're listening to, go back and listen to the rest of them. I promise that you'll like them. we got some great stuff planned between now and the election in November. My name is Drew Glover, your host, city council candidate for the Santa Cruz City Council vote. elections this November. Vote. That's right. Get out vote, and register someone. If, if you're registered to vote, go and register someone else. The key is getting people out because we found statistically that when people show up, progressives win. Say Drew Glover. Say it a few times, folks. It's <laughs> really so you for sure. It's kind of like Beetlejuice. <laughs> no. See you next time.